Good evening, everybody. I hope all is well with you. And, uh, you know, just praying for this study. I've been praying for you uh, before uh, we began this study um, tonight. Uh, pray for me as well. There's just some things going on that, uh, you know, I, I'm just praying over in my life. Uh, we're going through the book of Romans on Wednesday nights. And, uh, you know, as always, I like to give a little bit of a background. I think it's important we get into the why. Um, it's important that we talk about why these books were written. It's important that we uh, continue to uh, understand the context. Uh, primarily, the majority of the Bible speaks of one thing pretty prevalently. You know, of course, it's, the, the gospel would be the obvious answer, but what's the point of it all is, is the unity within the church. Let, let's consider a few things a moment. If you go back to the beginning, Adam and Eve were separated in a sense. When they ate the fruit, their eyes were open. They discovered they were naked and they hid from each other. They didn't simply just try to hide from one another. They also tried to hide from God. Um, it's a significant thing. And so we look at the entirety of the Bible, the Old Testament, as God's plan of trying to restore fallen creation back to himself. And so in the Old Testament, God singles out one man, Abraham. And he does so in a way in which Abraham cannot boast upon, a, upon himself. So when Abraham... Uh, is chosen. He, he's an old man with a barren wife. He has no children, yet God promises him he's going to be the father of not merely a great nation, of many nations. God promises at that same time that he is going to uh, bless Abraham abundantly and that all nations of the world through him will be blessed. And so let's continue down that path. <clears throat> Abraham has a son named Isaac uh, who through impossible things. I mean, Abraham and his son, um, through his wife's maidservant, Hagar, um, and she gave birth to Ishmael, but Ishmael was not the son of the promise. It was Sarah, who was barren and advanced in years, who had Isaac. So Isaac marries Rebekah. And they have two sons. But it's not the older son, as was the custom, and, and still in many parts of the world is the custom. It wasn't the older son who received the portion of the inheritance or the blessing of his father. It was Jacob, through his own um, deviance <laughs> and through his mother's deviance. They inherited, or he, he, he stole his brother's birthright with a bowl of soup. And he stole his brother's blessing by dressing up and imitating his brother to his blind father. Not the way I would have had it if I was God, but yet God chose this not because of Jacob's righteousness, but because of God's promise and God's righteousness. Fast forward. You go on. You've got this guy Moses. And, and Moses was born at a time when many Jewish boys were being drowned in the river uh, in Egypt because of the people who were slaves um, within the boundaries of Egypt. And so, you know, Moses was raised with his mother until he was three years old. She literally uh, fed him and weaned him and things like that. And so even though he grew up in the house of Pharaoh, he always grew up knowing his heritage as well. So he tries to murder somebody. <laughs> uh, he murders an a Egyptian overseer who's beating a slave. And then one of the slaves the next day calls him out. Are you going to murder me too? When he's fighting with another person and Moses is trying to break it up. Moses tried to be the savior that he thought he was. And so he fled for 40 years in the desert. And then he's called by a burning bush. And at that point, Moses is a broken man because when God calls him to Egypt, he makes every excuse he can. And so Moses eventually agrees reluctantly to go and do as God called him to do, and he unifies this slave culture of Hebrews within Egypt, and through God's power, through these ten plagues, through God parting the sea, and, and so many miracles, God eventually does lead this st stiff-necked, stubborn people into Israel. 
Well, Israel fails to live up to God's promise over and over and over again. So they're exiled from their land. They're brought back together. And then God, again, through one man, through Jesus Christ, fulfills the promises that was given to Abraham all those years before. But we've got to remember half of that promise. It wasn't simply for Abraham's descendants. It was that all nations of the world would be blessed. Israel failed to do that. But Jesus Christ, upon the cross, began turning backwards the curse that was upon mankind. And so when we see throughout the book of Acts, the word of God isn't merely appearing to the Jewish people anymore. It's going all over the world. It's Jews and Gentiles. In the book of Romans, Paul is writing to unify a Jewish and Gentile mixed church where there's some folks in there who are trying to get the Gentiles to believe this way and and get circumcised and all these other things, following the legalistic means. But Paul's trying to teach how the grace of Jesus Christ unifies all mankind as was God's intent. So we've got to understand that the backdrop of this, a lot of people take this book and they turn it into this legalistic, you have to follow this, you have to do this, you have to... That's missing the entire point. The point of the majority of Scripture, and I know this is a long backdrop, but I think it needs to be said. The point of the majority of the New Testament Scripture is to unify the church, to bring people together under the grace of Jesus Christ. And we've got to remember that. Part of the reason why, in chapter 1, we talked about last week, He said, the righteous shall live by faith. He was trying to speak to the legalists. But at the same time, he was also speaking against idolatry within the Gentile world. So he's trying to find a way through this book, through Jesus Christ, to unify a church that's divided by religious tradition and divided by idolatrous tradition and find a way to to remove both and bring them together under the banner of Christ and to follow him. That being said, let's jump right into chapter 2. Therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge, remember he was talking in the last chapter, we just talked about this, about uh, legalism and about idolatry. Therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself Since you, the judge, do the same things. What's he talking about here? We have to make judgment calls every single day. Let's think about that. There are times we have to discern if there's a place we need to be or not. There's times we have to make judgment calls about certain people who are healthy for us to be around and certain people who are unhealthy for us to be around. When I first came back to Christ as a young man, I had a group of friends that I loved dearly. I had to tell them all, though, because every time I was around them, I didn't like who I was when I was around them, so I'm going to have to make a change. I'm not going to ask them to change. I need to make the change. And I said, I love you all, but I just can't be around you anymore. I wasn't being judgmental against them. I was judging myself. I was judging who I was becoming, the language I would say, the things I would watch, the things I would do. And so having changed myself, I was not judging them, if that makes sense. Ooh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Uh, (laughs) It says, we know God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. When we judge, there's an old saying, and I think it proves pretty true. When you point one finger, there's at least three more pointing back at you. It's talking about condemning others based upon appearance, condemning others based upon ethnicity, condemning others based upon uh, man-made judgments. I think, or I hope that makes sense. So when it says here that there's people who are being judged or who are judging and they're going to be condemned themselves, he's saying we look down on our noses at people for basically either the things we do physically or the things we entertain within our own hearts. And we've got to remember what it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's times within church that... uh, Elders must make some calls. There has to be discipline within the church if people are living in sin and things like that. 
But when we are putting ourselves on this judgment seat and condemning others and looking down on our nose or looking down our nose at them, we're actually calling ourselves into condemnation. <laughs> because uh, what did Jesus say? The measure you use will be used against you. In that very same sermon, he also said, why look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when you have a tree growing out of your own? And so he says, first remove the tree to see clearly, and then you can remove the speck. In other words, don't judge people based upon their sin in a sense that uh, you're just condemning them. Or to correct each other. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching and correcting and rebuking and reproving that the man of God may be fully equipped. So the judgment that Paul is talking about here in Romans chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 2 is not making those judgment calls. We're to correct each other. But we're not to do so in a way that says, well, you're just going to hell anyway. <laughs> All right, moving on from that. Verse 3 says, Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same that you'll escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience? Let's take a look at those characteristics of God's there. We always wonder, why doesn't God step in and do something? When we see evil in the world, why doesn't God stop it? Listen to these words that Paul uses to describe God. His kindness, his restraint, and patience. God is literally giving everyone a chance. We talked about the Old Testament just a little while ago. If you look at the Old Testament, when God talks about judging the nations that were in Israel before Israel inherited the land, he said, I've given them an opportunity to repent and they have it. So now I'm using you to judge them. When God used other nations to judge Israel, God was saying, I'm not condoning what these other nations do, but you need to be judged. And so he used those other nations to judge the nation of Israel. God is patient. He gives people an opportunity to repent. If you even look at the ten plagues in Egypt, God gave Pharaoh, at first, opportunities to repent. It was only until later that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. God always gives. You go back uh, to the back of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, when the bowls of wrath are being poured out and the plagues fall upon mankind, this one little phrase is repeated over and over and over again. This plague happened, but mankind did not repent. God is patient. He's kind. He doesn't want to judge us. He gives us an opportunity to repent. He gives us an opportunity to, to submit and to surrender. He doesn't judge us right away in our sins because he's trying to teach us a lesson. There's times when I'm, I'm trying to discipline my children and I don't act as heavy-handed as I, as I want to because sometimes the fear of punishment is punishment enough. <laughs> it's pathetic sometimes the way the young ones especially holler and carry on. And sometimes that fear of being punished is enough to even just get a confession. And so what if that's kind of the way we approach God is, Lord, I don't want to face your wrath. I don't want to break your heart. You have shown me great kindness and patience. And so we look at this. When we start judging other people and God has forgiven us, then we are putting ourselves on a higher judgment seat than God. That's what Paul's saying right here. Jesus talked about this, the parable of the unmerciful servant. You know, that servant who was forgiven, what was it, 20 years wages? He was forgiven 20 years wages, flat out, because the master felt sorry for him and had mercy on him. And yet, he saw someone who owed him a week's wages. He choked him out and threw him in prison. And so when the master found out that that servant did not forgive the debt, that was owed, but instead uh, was unmerciful. The master revoked his mercy. When we forget that God is patient with us and we put ourselves up on a judgment seat that is higher than his, what we end up doing is we end up turning backwards in other people's minds, especially the mercies and kindness and patience of our God. 
So we need to remember, love and forgiveness is something that even at the very beginning of this book, Paul is trying to stress. You think about what we just talked about. There was some tension in the Roman church. You had the Jewish Christians and you had the Gentile Christians and they weren't getting along. And so Paul said, look, some of y'all were legalistic and some of you were, were trying to follow a law that was not going to save you. Some of you were idolaters and some of you were doing all these things. If you can't learn to forgive each other and you can constantly condemn one another, God is not going to grant his mercies and forgiveness to you. And so we need to look at that. We, we, we need to stop necessarily looking down on people and saying, you're all a bunch of sinners. Because guess what? So are we all. <laughs> we all. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it is because of his rich mercy. It is because of his grace. It is because of what he has done. Just as we talked about in the beginning. God chose Abraham, but it wasn't Abraham who did it. It was God who did it. God chose Jacob, but it wasn't Jacob who did it. God did it. God chose Israel, but it wasn't Israel who did any of the works. It was God who did it all. We need to recognize that it is God who is forgiving us. It is God who is curing us of our sin problem. And it is God who has forgiven us of our debts. So who are we to condemn others for debts that we perceive they owe ours? What does the King James say? Lord, forgive us our debts. No, that's a uh, trespasses was theirs. But most modern versions put it, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, Lord, forgive me the debts I owe you and help me to forgive those who I feel owe me a debt. That is the Christian way to walk. We have to walk in forgiveness and in love. Now, listen to this though. God, in spite of his kindness and his patience and his restraint. Listen to this. But because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. Now, this is an important thing. Even though God is merciful, even though he is patient and kind and is showing restraint, eventually God does deal with sin. God deals with it. We look all around us. I mean, today I just watched a protest video out in California uh, of where a, a doctor and a former Marine was calling guys out on their oaths that they made to the Constitution. I thought it was an awesome thing to see somebody remind somebody of that. However, you know, when I look at all that, we're not to be up in arms about things. Because we are using a, a measurement of, just, of judgment that is reserved for God alone. God alone is going to judge. God has to judge. We are looking around and we feel, oh, we've got to do something. We've got to protest. We've got to yell. We've got to shout. We've got to scream. Sometimes maybe we're called to do those things. I don't know. But God will handle it. We're going to find out in Romans 12. Paul writes this at the end of it. If your enemy is hungry... Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you'll pour hot coals over, your head, over his head. And what he says before that, though, he says, Do not pay anyone evil for evil, but instead leave it up to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's not up to us to pay someone back. The Old Testament law, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, all of that was because God is a God of justice. But that was the law of the land. That's not the law of the church. The law of the church is not do back to others what they have done unto you. Jesus actually takes that same law and he twists it to show God's true purpose. The purpose of those laws was to make it so brutal to actually commit a crime. And what is more brutal to commit or to, to show the judgment. He wanted to put people in his place. If someone wrongs you and knocks out your tooth, you have to go and do that to them. At that point, most people wouldn't even want to exact justice. And they're saying, God is saying, he's making a statement in those Old Testament scriptures. Be careful what you wish for. Because I'm going to have to do that someday. And it is not a task that I take lightly. Lightly. 
God is a God of justice. He is going to judge righteously, but he's holding back because he is waiting for those who will repent to turn back to him. And if God is that patient, then we need to pray for that patience. Verse 6, listen to this, and this is hard. He will repay each one according to his works. If we are judging other people, Paul writes earlier in this verse that we are condemning ourselves. So if we are sitting on the judgment seat of God and we are condemning other people, then God is going to judge us by the works that we have done because we are judging people based upon their own works. This is God's moral obligation that he is planning to fulfill himself. Listen, he'll repay each one according to his works, eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good Seek glory, honor, and immortality. But wrath and indignation to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth, but are obeying unrighteousness. Let's think about this. Let's break these two different contrasts down. Eternal life to those who persist in doing good. Seek glory, honor, and immortality. So, Is he saying that eternal life goes to those who do good works? Absolutely not. When we look at the Bible, a lot of people will like to point at churches and say, well, y'all are just a works-based church if, if you believe X, Y, or Z and the other. No, I'm going to tell you something. If you are following God and you love him with all your hearts, the good works are a byproduct of that relationship. You're not going to... Uh, be a person who is self-centered and uh, 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 self-seeking. If you think about the way Jesus broke it down, he says not, you know, um, he'll separate them from the right and the left as a shepherd does the sheep to the goat. And he'll say to those on the right, come to me and and enter the kingdom prepared for you before the beginning of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. And the righteous will ask, Lord, when did we do any of those things? He says, and he will look at them and say, whatever you did to the least of these, my brothers, you've done unto me. And if you think about it, the contrast to those on the left, it's the exact opposite. They didn't do any of those things and were surprised. Why were each side surprised? Because those who were doing the works didn't even realize they were doing righteousness. It was just something they did as they went along the way. It was natural to show hospitality. It was natural to show grace. It was natural to show generosity. It was natural for them. Why? Because of who they knew. They knew Jesus. And because they knew Jesus, they were naturally inclined to doing things that honored him. They were naturally inclined to seek his honor and glory in everything. They sought Jesus. And in seeking Jesus, they did good things to people, not by what they could gain from it, but by who Jesus was. And those who were self-seeking, those on the opposite end, they just passed by everything. They were so busy looking at themselves. Listen to this other half. Those who are, are for wrath and indignation, They're self-seeking, disobey the truth, and obeying unrighteousness. Doesn't necessarily mean they were bad people. Let's think about that. There's going to be a lot of good people who are going to be surprised on that day. Because they were so busy worrying about themselves. Let's think about what this coronavirus has really done. And there's a blessing in the middle of all this, in spite of how we feel about it. People have been too busy. They've been roaming around, trying to fill every little aspect of their schedule with work, with fun, and with every other, with sports, and with every other thing they can imagine. People who go to church, but they don't have time to to sit with God every morning. There's people who say, I don't have time for church, that now have no other option on a Sunday but to log into their their Facebook or or a live stream and, and, and see what's going on. We're looking at something that God has given us as a gift. We make ourselves too busy. We pass up great things, godly things, 
for good things. It's not terrible to be wealthy. It's not a, a sin. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But being wealthy is not a sin. It's not sinful to be busy. To, to be doing things that are, are helpful for you and your family. To be, to be making money to support your life. Those aren't bad things. But when we pass up on all those things, or when we, we, we pass up Jesus for all those things, we're self-centered. Let's think about the rich young ruler for a minute. The rich young ruler was a good man. By all accounts, he was generous. He, he honored his parents. He obeyed the Ten Commandments. But he put his faith not in God, but in his wealth and his own means of production. That was the lesson Jesus was trying to teach him. I'm fairly certain that if he said, okay, Lord, I'll do all that, Jesus would have said, you know what? If that is what you feel like you have to do, but I just wanted to see. Let's think about this for a minute. God gave Abraham a similar test. When God said, take your only son, Isaac, whom you love, up to the mountain and, and, and sacrifice him. Abraham trusted God so much that he knew that this son that God had promised him would still fulfill all the promises that God had said. He took him up and he even had the knife. An angel had to stop him from doing it and said a sacrifice has already been provided. What's great about that is a ram was provided, but God already knew that there was an ultimate sacrifice that was provided. Sometimes God asks us and tests us to see how much we really love him. And it's not for God to know because God knows our hearts it's for us to know that young man went away sad because he knew that he couldn't walk away from everything he had acquired and good men and good women are living lives of unrighteousness not because they're doing anything bad but because they're focused on themselves and when we are focused on ourselves instead of being focused on God we're missing the point Verse 9 says this, Affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. Now think about this for a minute. We just talked about that church. Chapter 1, Paul begins by um, breaking down what the, the, the Jewish unrighteousness was and what the Gentile unrighteousness was. So he's saying there are people who think they are going to heaven First to the Jew, then to the Greek, but they are doomed for affliction and distress. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does what is good. First to the Jew, because why? The promise came to them first. And also to the Greek. There is no favoritism with God. Why is he writing this? Because as we've been saying, the purpose of this book is unity. He's trying to say that because you're Jewish, wonderful. You received the promise first. You followed God faithfully first. But these Gentile believers, they've come in now and they're a part of it. God doesn't care if you're Jewish or Greek. You all go to the same reward. Some just might get there first. And so why are we judging other people? Sometimes we, you know, and, and I love uh, that we've been doing this driving service. Uh, we're going to continue doing it through May. Now, here's something I do got to say. We're not judging you if you forget to put your pants on, you know, because you've been coming to church dressed or you've been watching on Facebook. But you sort of do have to dress. I'm still going to wear jeans and a button-up. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. But, you know, we're not going to judge you for what you wear at church. We're not going to judge you for who your family was. We're not going to judge you for the choices you've made. That's not who we are or what we're supposed to do. We've got to remember that God's salvation is for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. What does it say over and over and over throughout the New Testament? Those who call upon the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. We need to remember who our Savior is. It's not you. It's definitely not me. It's not our elders. It's not our deacons. It is by what God has done and following him alone is what saves us. He doesn't have a special place in heaven necessarily for me because I'm, I'm preaching. There are certain rewards that are going to be given out 
I don't know what those are. I mean, it says in the Bible there's crowns of life and things like that. There's crowns for various things. But we all get to be with Jesus together. There's not going to be, okay, Brian, you did this, so this is going to be your part. You get uh, row A, uh, seat number two. (laughs) The only ones that I know that get special seats are the 24 elders, the 12 patriarchs, and the 12 apostles. Those are the only ones I know who have any special seat. They're wearing crowns, but every night, every day, night and day, they're casting them down before the throne of God because he's the only one that matters. We all get the same God when we get to him. We all get Jesus together. So let's stop showing any favoritism whatsoever. Let's stop making judgment calls about one another. That's what Paul is saying. Now listen to this. All those who sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all those who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So if you sin against God, whether it's by the law or outside the law, you're going to be judged by a righteous God who must judge righteously. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be declared righteous. Doesn't this sound like James? It's amazing how the Bible confirms itself. It says, do not be hearers of the word only, but be doers. Jesus even said this. Listen to this. This isn't a works-based thing. This is something Jesus himself said. Those who hear these words of mine and do them are like a righteous man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rock or the rains came and the floods came and the house beat against it, the house stood firm. But those who hear these words of mine and do not do them, this is Jesus' words, not mine. It's like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And when the rains came and the floods came and the wind beat against it, the house fell and great was the fall. When Jesus says something, guess what he expects? Obedience. I'm going to say this, and not because I'm trying to get us to be a righteous-based, you know, call someone in. Uh, there's, a, there's not going to be a hotline at the church when you see someone committing a sin. But the love language of God is obedience. How do we know? All throughout Scripture, he says the same thing. I require obedience, not sacrifice. To obey is better than the fat of rams. Jesus said, find out what these words mean. I require mercy, not sacrifice. If you love me, says Jesus, you'll obey my commands. He said it three times at the Last Supper. If Jesus repeats something three times, you guarantee it's important. To obey is to love God. As a matter of fact, let's think about wedding vows. Most wedding vows, since I don't know when, have had the words to honor and obey. The reason why so many of us get divorced, and I'm not knocking people who've been divorced. I know it's messy. I've seen it in my family. I'm not trying to open wounds. But the reason why is we can't reconcile those words to honor and obey. We can't obey one another. You look at Ephesians chapter 6 when Paul is talking about marriage. Before he talks about wives submitting to husbands, The verse right before that says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. We're to submit to one another. It's a language of love. I can't go out and say I love my wife and run around on her. I have to obey my vows to her. I have to be true to her. I have to love and nourish her. Read Ephesians chapter 6. You think wives submit to your husband is oppressive? Look at the instruction manual for husbands. (laughs) there's a lot more that the husband has to do than the wife. He's supposed to lay down his life for her. So if Paul writes these things, he, he, even in the middle of that Ephesians chapter five, right there, he says, I tell you a great mystery, but I'm speaking of Christ in the church. We're to lay our lives, our lives down for one another and lay our lives down for the cause of Christ. It's a hard thing for us to do because We're so fiercely independent. We're rebellious at heart. But what we must do is remember God knows we love him by our obedience. David, a man after God's own heart, was a sinful man. But in all things, he took his punishment with submission. He sought after the Lord in all things. 
He repented of his sins. And he moved forward seeking after God. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means we're obedient. And it means when we mess up, we admit it and we move on. Proverbs says, a righteous man may stumble seven times in a day, but he gets up seven times. It means that when we fall, we fall forward. We fall towards God and we get back up and we keep moving forward. We keep straining towards God. Now listen to this. So when Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively do what the law demands, their law to themselves, even though they do not have the law, they show the work of the law is written on their hearts. Everybody knows it. Let's think about this. This is the, the, one of the poorest arguments for a lack of God. Everybody instinctively knows it's wrong to murder. Everyone inst instinctively knows it's wrong to steal. It's not something that society created. It's something that on instinct everybody knows. I mean, you think about the most basic thing. If you've ever watched two little ones fight, the reason they're fighting is because one kid had a toy and took it from the other. And so there's a sense of justice that's ingrained into them. It is written upon our hearts. God wrote his law on our hearts. We know and we have no excuse before him what is right and what is wrong. And he's going to judge based upon the law that we know. Now listen. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts will either accuse or excuse them on the day of God's judgment. What people have kept secret according to my gospel through Jesus Christ. In other words, God is going to lay everything bare. Our hearts are going to be open to him. He cannot or we cannot hide a single thing. But listen to this. Now, if you call yourselves a Jew and rest in the law, by the way, did I mention this is about unity? <laughs> Boast in God, know his will and approve the things that are superior being instructed from the law. And if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the full expression of knowledge and truth in the law, you then who teach one another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal, do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And by the way, how did Jesus define that? You may not do the physical act, but what's in your heart condemns you. You who detest idols, do you rob their temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For it, as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Let's think about this. The things that we judge people for, as Jesus said, as you measure, it will be measured back to you. What Paul is saying here is that the law does not make us righteous. Following a set of rules does not make you good before God. Obedience has to come because you love God, love God not because you're afraid of punishment. Obedience has to come because you love your father. I, I look at my young ones. I got four boys between the ages of three and nine. And they're always seeking my approval. They're seeking my approval because they know I have expectations of them. And they know I love it when they do good and I detest it when they do bad. When they do good, oftentimes they will get rewarded even if it's not something they realize is a reward. If they, get, if they do something that is evil, I'll get them a chance to make up for it. But oftentimes I've got to discipline them for it. We need to make sure that we are not judging people based upon a set of standards that we don't hold, to our, hold ourselves to. We need to make sure that we are seeking after Christ and Christ alone. The good works we do, as I said earlier, they're a byproduct. They're not the, the, the way to salvation. When we look down on somebody else, we're saying, my, uh, my goodness trumps your badness. When we judge people, we're basically saying, well, at least my sin isn't as great as theirs. Guess what? To God, all sin is equal. <laughs> and on the day of judgment, if you are judging yourself based upon your righteousness, you're going to fall. But he goes on to this. 
There's hope. He doesn't just simply condemn. He says, for circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. In other words, the whole law. If you judge people based on one aspect of the law, you're going to be judged on the whole aspect of the law. But if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will his circumcision not be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised but who fulfills the law will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. For a person is not, who is not a Jew, who is one outwardly, and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. That man's praise is not from men, but from God. In other words, guess what? You and I, by believing in Christ, by doing our best to please Him and to serve Him and to love Him, we are grafted into that promise of Abraham. Whether or not we have the physical mutilation of the flesh, what is required more is of the heart. And actually, what Paul is, is talking about here is actually found in the Old Testament. He says, circumcise your hearts your, your, your observance of the law makes no difference if your heart is hard as stone. And we have to ask ourselves that question every day. Lord, is my heart hard? If not, cut away the stone and give me a heart of flesh. Father, mark me as yours. And how do we know? What's the litmus test of that? They will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. We will be called righteous based upon how we believe God, not how we observe the law. If you think about this, did Abraham have the law? The law wasn't given until Moses. There was no form of righteousness. I'm, I'm reading the book of Job in my own personal study right now. Job didn't have the law. Matter of fact, when he and his three buddies are talking about why Job must have been punished, it's based on their own righteousness that they're judging Job. <laughs> based on human standards. We need to stop and step back and ask ourselves, Lord, is my heart hard or not? Now, I'm going to say this. If you're listening to this message and you say, oh, I wish so-and-so would watch this. Look in a mirror. Because Really, when we hear the word of God, the word of God is for us at that moment. The Lord is trying to speak to us at that moment. We need to, to, to stop and examine ourselves through the scriptures. We need to stop and listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking. I don't care if my kids need to hear this message right now. I need to hear this message as I'm preaching it. This message is for me, not just simply you the hearer, but for me the speaker. And if I'm speaking this and I'm not living it, that I'm living in sin because I'm expecting people to live up to a standard that I myself am not holding me to. So let's look at this. Chapter 2 of Romans is all about judgment. God will judge because he is righteousness and must judge. But we are not to judge one another based upon our own righteousness. Rather, we are to let God judge. Now, does that, again... We go back. Does it mean we don't correct one another? Absolutely not. But the way in which we correct each other isn't based upon some human standard of righteousness. It's based upon observing God and loving Him and obeying Him. Let's be that people that God's calling us to be. All right. That, I think that's all I got for this week. Do you have anything? All right. With that being said, we'll see you all next week. God bless. Uh, men's prayer is gathering at 7 o'clock here in the fellowship hall. Uh, we are going to socially distance and be responsible, but uh, pray for us as we're praying for the church. God bless. <laughs>